Now during this re-examination of Jonah, we need to look at some of the background of this narrative in order to fill in the blanks. Now it's not to say that Jonah is justified in his disobedience, however, it will better help us to understand his reluctance in fulfilling this particular assignment. You see, Nineveh was a city of a very wicked nation, Assyria. Now to say the least, wickedness really is an understatement. There are in fact reliefs that depict chariots with two to four armed men, and it was known that once the city was defeated, they were known to torture the captives, dismember uh, their captives, cut off the heads of their captives. You see, the Assyrian Empire was a constant threat to Israel both before and after Jonah's time. So it would seem like this prophecy to Nineveh was just Jonah's only prophecy, but there are others. In fact, in 2 Kings 14, uh, Jonah prophesied that Jeroboam would be able to restore Israel. So during Jonah's time, because of the internal troubles in Assyria, Jeroboam in fact was able to complete this restoration of Israel's northern borders in addition to many other things. Nevertheless, Assyria remained a real threat to Israel. It turns out, because they were able to get these things done and because of this prophetic word, that they began to really kind of feel self-assured, that they felt triumphant in their own strength, that there was this laxing of pressure from the enemies in different areas. The result was they became complacent and they thought no one could touch them. Now this wasn't because they were faithful to the covenant, but they thought just because they were God's chosen people. But here's the problem. Great moral decay. God sends to them prophets to bring about repentance. But despite the prophets' admonishments, idolatry spread. So it was during this time that the Lord sent Amos and Hosea to announce to his people Israel that he would no longer spare them, but he would send them into Assyria. Parallel to this, during this time, the Lord also sent Jonah to Nineveh to warn it of the imminent danger of divine judgment. Two prophecies crossing each other. What we need to remember is that Jonah is not a prophet of Assyria, but he's a prophet of Israel. In fact, he received his prophetic appointment from Elisha. So what has God done? God has sent the prophet outside of his comfort zone to a nation outside of his covenant. But Jonah is uneasy with this assignment. Why? Because Jonah has come to be distrusted. In fact, they call Jonah a false prophet. Why? He was sent to Jerusalem to foretell its doom, but the inhabitants repented and the disaster didn't happen. Then Jewish tradition holds that knowing the Ninevites were also on the point of repenting, he feared God would earn the reputation of being a false god. So we've got a false prophet and a false god potentially. Nevertheless, God wants to include this book of Jonah because it has purpose. Is God trying to show Israel why they have survived in spite of being under the reign of Jeroboam's wickedness? Is it a lesson on grace? Have they forgotten God is safety to those who fear him, but danger to those who disregard him? Why is Jonah concerned about God's reputation. Listen, God knows all of us, and he knows us all the way down to the microscopic cellular level. As it's written in Jeremiah, before you were formed, I knew you. You see, we're, we're not a surprise to God. Our ups, our downs, our strengths, our weaknesses, he knows us. God knew Jonah, and he knew how he would respond to this excitement. 
Jonah had experienced the wickedness of his Assyrian neighbors as a young child. He grew up under the Assyrian threat. Now I want you to imagine this. God notifies Jonah that he needs to deliver a word to the city of Nineveh. A message for Assyria. Now you can imagine maybe there's a little bit of excitement. This is a word from the Lord. An assignment for God to Assyria. Surely the Lord is about to rain down his fury and rain down his judgment against his enemies. Surely. But that's not the message. The message of the book of Jonah is that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God is willing to withhold judgment when people repent. And you'll find that in Jonah 3.10. Now the Israelites, like Jonah, needed to realize that God's grace was great enough not only to cover their sins, but great enough to cover the sins of other nations. You see, God is a God of second chances when we turn to Him. The reality is God has called us. He knows us, and there are times that the assignment He gives us is to help us know ourselves as well as He does. The assignment is not about a revelation of God's character, but a revelation about our own character. The anointing isn't about what is being revealed in others, but what is being revealed about us. God is wanting to draw us closer. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, our prayer must be that God will strengthen us for the journey and the calling He's assigned us in this life. And that in this journey, He will uncover our own personal prejudices, our own bitterness that's hidden in our heart that can pervert the love of God within us. So there have to be some lessons that we've learned in this second flyby. Number one, there may come a day that an assignment from God will take us out of our comfort zone and demand that we use all of our faith to trust that where God is leading us, we should follow. I'll say that again. Where God is leading us, we should follow. Secondly, God is a God of mercy. And just as we expect the full extent of God's mercy in our lives, we should not be angry when He extends that mercy to others. You see, the scripture says God is not slack concerning His promises, but His delayed judgment is so that Others, more can come to repentance. God is on a rescue mission. Number three, Jonah is considered a minor prophet. But nothing we do for God should be considered minor. Everything he does has major implications and major impact. Number four, last but definitely not least, we live to serve the King. Our undying devotion must come with the commitment to go where He wants us to go, say what He wants us to say, and do what He wants us to do. But if we're honest, we may just have our own Jonah moments, the reluctance, the uneasiness, the question. So our prayer must be for God to strengthen us on this journey that he has personally picked us for. So tell me something. Can you say this? I live to serve the king.